please stand by. We'll be streaming live soon. Stella alva brilha em mim Brilha a luz que inunda o meu viver Please stand by. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you, wherever you are. Um, last time we were in Mark chapter 9, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and ask the Lord to help us as we walk through this. And Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time, and I ask you, Lord, to help those that hear this. Uh, let it be a blessing to them, but let the word grow into their hearts and grow as the seed in good soil in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we walked through chapter 9 last time, uh, we got through and talked about unbelief and how uh, that the father whose son was in the fire and the disciples couldn't cast it out. It wasn't because it was a super demon. It was because of unbelief and what they needed to do uh, to deal with unbelief, fasting and prayer. Now, at this point, we're down to verse 42. We want to finish up there. 40, verse 42, Jesus is warning of offenses. And he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Then down to verse uh, uh, 43, the next verse, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed. And then he goes down and he says, if your foot causes you to sin and if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. And he speaks about you'll end up in a place where their worm does not die and the fire's not quenched. You know, I think if we took that seriously, uh, our, our whole approach to what we do uh, with the scriptures would be different. Um, I'm asking God to help me see this clearly especially now at this time of the, in our country's history. Um, he's talking about whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble. Now just think what we're doing in this country. And think what we've allowed to do because we've not prayed and not gotten in or, in or involved in, in politics is, is the word. Well, I don't want to just preach the gospel. I don't want to get involved in politics. Well, look what we end up doing. We've got... Abortion is out of control, and we have an administration that just wants to have as much abortion as possible and wants us to fund it all over the world. Uh, we got this transgenderism where people can't, are confused anyway, and we're, we're more confusing them. Uh, uh, you know, I looked, at it, I looked this up, and I saw how, you know, God said I made man and, and woman, and they're to get married. Male and female. It's not complicated. One or two. And uh, if you look about building a family, the the physics work out great um, between a man and a woman. And but the thing I googled on looked up said there was 52 genders. I I kid you not. 52 different genders. I I I was stunned. I didn't even read on. I didn't need to. Um, we got teaching kindergarten about homosexuality. Um, and it's a lifestyle that Jesus doesn't approve. Those are what we're dumping on our kids. And maybe we're wondering why we got COVID and a lot of other things. Well, go to Deuteronomy 28 and you'll find out. Jesus, the, God said, if you do these things, it'll work out. If you don't, it's going to happen over here. So we're not following anything that he's told us as a country right now. So anyway, so this is, this is an issue that he's talking about here. Now look down at verse 49. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Everyone will be seasoned with fire. Okay? Now, uh, part of the parable of the sower, the sower sows the word, and these are they hear the word, immediately Satan comes, not God, but Satan, comes to steal the word. Now, at this point, if your salt and you lose your saltiness, how would you make it salty again? This is a problem that he's talking about. We'll be seasoned with fire as you start stepping out and doing what God's called you to do. If he's called you to, to move from this city over here, take an accountant job, or be a, be a teacher, or be a, a shop foreman, or 
mechanic or whatever he's called you to be, as you step out and try to do what he's called you to do, Satan's going to do everything he can to stop you. I see this in the, uh, in the um, uh, recovery and addiction uh, program that, our, that was started by our church, uh, Fresh Wind. Uh, guys get in there and the Lord starts moving in their lives and there's so many things that are coming against them and they can't separate between what's God and what's not and they end up leaving before their time was up and they end up going right back into the soup again. So um, let's be salt and salt ha flavors things. You don't need a lot of salt, you just need some salt. Okay, verse chapter 10, verse 1. This is a difficult one for me. I... My wife and I have been together since 75, so I don't have to, uh, I don't know about divorce. I'm not divorced. Um, she was divorced when we got married, and it, it, it's a sin that can forgive. Okay? Now, Jesus said in chapter 10, verse 1, Then he arose from the and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again. See, here's the crowds coming again. And he was, as he was accustomed, he taught them again. What's he teaching them? He's teaching them the word. The Pharisees asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce? And then Jesus goes through and gives them a pretty specific uh, explanation. Moses granted it. It wasn't the way God wanted it. He said, uh, a man will leave his wife, a man will leave his mother and father and join his wife and they'll become one. And he said, it's not what God wanted, but he allowed it because of your hardness of heart. That's what Moses set up rules for, your hardness of heart. Again, God's given us very clear commands and because of the hardness of our heart, we uh, reject that and then we end up uh, with the messes that we're in now. Now, he goes on down, and this is interesting, I had a pastor talk to me about it. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Uh, this pastor had a, a very good reason for being divorced. He got divorced, and he met a, a Christian woman, and they, she was divorced. So they wanted to get together, but they, didn't, they, they, they were hung up on this verse, and, they, and it really bothered him. Now, I don't remember exactly what it was that they how they worked through it, but to me it was you sinned. And Jesus came to forgive sins, so let's get forgiven and move on. That but this really becomes a problem with some people. So not having been divorced, I don't really have. Uh, I, I can't really comment on this. It would be would mean much because I've not been there. Now he goes on and. We're talking about another uh, subject that I know nothing about is having kids because we don't have kids. Uh, and I've never had kids, so I, there's no little Andes running around anywhere, thank goodness. And uh, But verse 13, they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. When Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took him up and he took the kid up in his arms and, and laid hands on him and blessed him. Now, um, what does it mean to receive the kingdom of God as a little child? I guess, from my perspective and from what I've seen, it's somebody just believe in Jesus at what he said. Just taking him at his word and saying, okay, this is what he said to do, I'll do it. I know I, I've read countless, countless uh, testimonies about people that have done this and been very successful. If you want to read one of, the, one of the more spectacular ones, read God's Smuggler by Brother Andrew. I think it was written in the late 60s. And um, he got saved and he, he, he said, well, I think, I believe the Lord wants me to take books into the communist country. So that's just what he did. And how he did it and the things that God did for him in there are they're just mind-blowing. Because he just simply trusted God to do what he said he'd do in his word. I think that's where we fail. We don't have the courage to do, step up and do what he did. One of, the, one of my favorite stories from him 
was uh, he was moving up to a checkpoint and he had a whole car full of Bibles. They weren't even hidden. A Russian, I think it was, no, it was Czechoslovakian checkpoint. Communist Czechoslovakia. And they, the car in front of him had a man, a woman, and, and one suitcase and it took an hour and a half. They went through every part of it. They took everything out, went under the car, went into the hood, went into the trunk, everything you can think of to see if there's any contraband in there. Well, he's got a whole seat load of Bibles, a whole back load of Bibles. He didn't even cover them. He said, I don't want anybody to think it was me being slick and covering these that you didn't find them, so you'll have to cover them. So he's getting ready to move up, and he says this prayer, Lord, you made blind eyes see in the New Testament. I'm asking you to make seeing eyes blind and not see any of these books. He pulls in. The guard, the, the, the guard looks in, asks him a few questions. In five minutes, he's gone. They didn't even look. Now, that takes guts to do that. It takes courage to do that, and it takes the ability to hear the Lord so you can do that. One other story that was great. He was given a Volkswagen, and he drove it about 500,000 miles through the just horrible terrain. And um, finally, the Lord spoke to a, to a um, mechanic in one of the countries that he was in, said, the Lord spoke to me and wants me to tune your car up. Okay. So he takes the car, and they drive it in, and I don't know, a couple of days later, the guy comes and he says, when was the last time you had a tune-up? Oh, man, I don't know. Been a while. He said, well, he said, you're driving a miracle because he said, you don't have any points in your car. But you have no points. It's not that I could fix them. They're just not there. The car can't run. He drove it all over Czechoslovakia, Poland, wherever else he was. He didn't know. He just did what God told him to do. Now, he didn't know, he wasn't a mechanic, he didn't know what to do with the car. Well, he gets the car back into Berlin, and it blows up. The engine just finally gives out and blows up on the highway. And it's right by a Volkswagen dealer. He goes in and asks them what they could do for it, and he says, we can fix it, it'll take 500 marks. He hadn't got a mark to his name, but he knows the Lord wants him to fix it, so he said, go ahead and fix it. When can I pick it up? They said, come back at 5 o'clock. Well, they go out, and he's thinking, I'll go get the mail. There'll be checks in the mail, something like that. Nothing happened. And he had some students with him. And those students, 4.30, quarter to 5, he's coming back. They have no money. No money at all. And uh, the students come back. And if, if I got the story right, the students had collected some money, and they had, 400, uh, they had 450 marks and they needed 500. And just as the store, he's walking up to pick up the car, a woman pulls up to the front and runs in and hands him 50 mark note. And he gets back. He had 500 marks. The guy cut the price down so they had enough marks to get gas and eat food on the way to the, back to their home base. The guy lived like that. Wouldn't you like to live like that? Well, you've got to have some courage to do that. And not very many of us do, and not very many of us actually believe what Jesus said in the book. We believe in God in John 3:16, but we don't necessarily believe in Mark 11:23, 24. So that's the purpose that we're trying to get accomplished here. We want to look and see what Jesus did and how we should be doing it. So now, after that, he runs into the rich young ruler one of my favorite guys in the New Testament. As he was going out the road, he came run, uh, this guy uh, came out on the road and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is verse 17. Jesus said to him, and I think this is a strange answer. He said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God. Now, I think we would all admit, he's not saying anything other than this guy's a good teacher. He's a good man. I appreciate that. But Jesus took that very seriously, and he said, nobody's good but God. And I, and I think of that. I go back to Matthew 12, 36 and 37, where he said, uh, we will be held accountable for every word spoken. And the, and the Amplified says, you will be held accountable for every idle, inoperative word that you speak. Ha. That's not good news especially if you uh, don't watch what you say. Now, at this point, he goes on to say to this kid, and he explains to him what's going on, 
You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. False witnesses. Easy for you to say. False witnesses. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. Now, he said, I've done all these things. Jesus said, that's great. One thing you lack, go sell what you got. Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come take up your cross and follow me. Verse 22. But he was sad at this word. And he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. His disciples were astonished at his words and said to them, How hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which was a gate in the city, a very small gate, than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. Well then, who can be saved? Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say, see, we have left all to follow you. And we know what he did. They walked out on their business and, and just left. Uh, John and James uh, didn't even clock out, left old man Zebedee standing there holding their time cards. They just lay, came in on land, dropped everything, and followed Jesus. Okay? Now listen to this response here, and we're going to talk about this in detail in just a second. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels. Now listen to verse 30. People don't want to read this one. but they, this, Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions. With persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now look, let's peel this back a little bit. First of all, Jesus knew who was going to betray him. Who was that? That was Judas. He was the treasurer. Uh, maybe this guy would have been a great treasurer. It seems like he managed money well. He's a young guy. So he's got a lot of stuff. So maybe he would have been a good replacement for Judas. Jesus was giving him that opportunity. But he left because his eyes were on his stuff instead of what Jesus said. I think we, everybody has to deal with that in the United States. I don't care who you are. Uh, we got stuff. We got a lot of stuff. I've been to Uganda three times with my pastor. And I can tell you, we got a lot of stuff. I got more stuff in my garage than most people over there have in their homes. Okay. So, but Jesus said to him, if you, you know, if you go to, I believe it's uh, uh, Luke 6, 38, it says, Give and it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Uh, you plant seeds that grow. If you plant corn, you get corn. You don't get watermelons. And if you plant one kernel of corn, you don't get back one kernel. You get more. That's how the seed and sowing works. And then Jesus likened what, was, what we were doing with, the sower sows the word, that's the seed, and it's planted in the ground, which is your heart. And he says here, with persecution, so that's one of the five weapons that Satan has. The more you start moving in what God's called you to do, he can't afford you, Satan can't afford you to be prosperous and, and have a lot extra, because if you do, you'll give it to people, and you'll, God will be able to use you to bless other people that aren't as fortunate. He can't have that. He's got to stop it in his cold. That's what the parable of the sower is all about. And right here, he mentions to us that if you give those things now, you're going to get more back. That's what he said at the end of the parable of the sower. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. The ones that received it in good ground and did what it said. So uh, I, this is just a, a natural law of God. This isn't a get-rich scheme. It's nothing like that. It's just simply telling you how God's kingdom operates. You plant seeds, they grow. And if they grow properly, they bear more fruit. You plant one apple, you may get a tree full of apples. Who knows? How many trees? It's like one guy said, uh, only God knows how many trees are in an apple seed or an acorn. How many oak trees are in an acorn? We don't know. Only God knows that. Now, 
Go down to verse 32. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going to see them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them things. Then he tells them very clearly, verse 33, Behold, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, scourge him, and spit on him and kill him. And on the third day he'll rise again. That's pretty clear language. Uh, they didn't understand it. They didn't get it. I don't know why. Their minds were blinded. They weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't know. But they didn't get it. And he goes on and he talks about serving. The greatness of serving. You know that all those in verse uh, 41. You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, at this point, he's talking about giving. Okay, You're here to serve. You're not here to be served. So what can we do to help people? That's one of the ways that we can affect the culture that we're in is to let them know that we're really interested in serving them, not our own interests. Um, so think about that. Think about what we could do to help. The, the schools are in a mess. They're in an absolute mess. What can we do to help the teachers be what God's called them to be? It just takes a little bit of salt. Let's be some salt and let's go in and find out what it is that God wants us to do to help our communities be what He wants them to be. Now, look down at 46, chapter 10, verse 46, and we'll finish up with Bartimaeus. Now, let me pull my notes around here. Now, they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude... Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now there's a great multitude again. We've got a lot of people there. And it's not quiet. There's a lot of people there. And he starts yelling. Then many warned him, be quiet. Shut up. Don't, don't bring attention to yourself. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called, and they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you now? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher, I want to receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now, all these people are there, and there are a lot of people yelling at him. There's a lot of people around there. Why did Jesus respond to Bartimaeus? Anybody have any idea? Well, I'll give you a clue. Go to John 5.19 and John 5.30, and I'll tell you, Jesus said, I only do the things I hear my see my father do, and I only say the things I hear my father say. So in his wanderings here, and he's walking around here, the Lord spoke to him, the father spoke to him and said, heal this guy. So that's what Jesus did. And it was his faith, he said right here, and Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. So Bartimaeus believed that if Jesus... If he got to talk to Jesus, Jesus would heal him. And he did. So, it gets back again to the word believe. What does it mean to believe for Jesus? We, you know, with COVID going around, as it has, we ask ourselves, what do we need to do to pray for Well, we can't go pray for people like we used to. I, I spent a lot of times with the other people of our church in the hospitals praying for people. Um, I'm one of the people that if there was a, if, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson was in the hospital, I'd go pray for them. 
uh, any time, a day, day or night. But we can't do that now. So how do we affect our faith and get accomplished what it is that Jesus has asked us to do? If we go back to the beginning of Mark and you follow Jesus, especially through the first three chapters, you'll see that uh, he healed people, he raised people from the dead, and he went out and he uh, cast out demons. So, uh, you know, one of the ways we could start is by asking the Lord to show us people that we can minister to where we're at. I don't want, you know, I don't want to have a, 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 if you don't have faith, if you have small amount of faith, Jesus said there's three kinds of faith. No faith, little faith, great faith. Uh, if you're in the little faith area, you don't want to try to take on a great faith argument. Okay? You don't want to walk into a chapel with hundreds of people and they're mourning a guy and go try to raise him from the dead. That's probably not a good thing. But now if the Lord told you to do it, you could do that. But in order to do that, you've got to be able to hear God. And John chapter 10, he talks in there greatly about, My sheep hear my voice, and the voice of a stranger they'll not follow. So I would suggest to us that what we do is go to Psalms, Find out what God's said to us about His promises, and uh, one of the one of my favorite ones is I'll turn there real quick. It just came to my mind. Psalm thirty-two, verses eight and nine. Now, here's what it says: the Lord said, "I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule." which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come with you. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. That's his promises to us. So in the morning, now um, another one, uh, start out the day with Psalm 5.3. And you could, if you could find this in the Passion Translation, I'll read it from the New King James. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And uh, in the Passion Translation, it says something similar to, uh, Lord, you'll hear me at first thing in the morning, and I will bring my life to you and lay it on the altar, and I'll wait for your fire to fall. I'll wait for the fire, your fire to fall in my life. So... One of the ways we can begin to do this is if we start praying and believing God that He will do this for us. So, uh, that pretty well covers Mark 9 and 10. Uh, are there any questions? Great. I must have done a good job then. Um, let me close in prayer. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the things that You did when you were here, and that you showed us how we can operate in the same word. I ask you to anoint us, Father, today. Open our ears so that when we pray in the morning, we can find out where you want us to go and what you want us to do, Father. We trust you, and we want to step out and do what we can do to help bring our culture back to some, some semblance of normalcy, Father. And based on your word, and we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. If any of you need any explanation or any more information, contact Rick Bonfim Ministries, and uh, they will certainly be glad to give you information on any of these subjects. So uh, thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you again.